Turing was a British mathematician who is often known as the father of the field of computer science. Thought of as being one of the most important figures of the construction of the electronic computer. This conception is due to his famous research on the universal Turing machine in 1936, which is often regarded as a blueprint of the modern com electronic computer, an ideal machine which could solve any problem that is solvable following only simple rules. Because of this and Turing's code-breaking effort against the Nazis, Turing has become famous worldwide. There are books written about Turing, buildings, roads, bridges named after him, as well as major Hollywood films. However, there is a historical debate on whether Turing's research on the universal Turing machine actually inspired and helped design the first modern electronic computers. With the automated computing engine and the electronic discrete variable automatic computer, or whether it was entirely an abstract mathematical idea that didn't foresee or act as a blueprint to build the electronic computer at all. Due to the popularity of Turing and his research, there are a lot of alternative accounts of this debate, and the conclusion is not clear, except that it is obvious there is no straightforward path from Turing's research in 1936 to the first stored program electronic computers of the 40s. Due to the complex nature of this problem, there have been researchers who have devoted their careers to studying Alan Turing. One of the most notable is Jack Copeland, who said, What Turing described in 1936 was not an abstract mathematical notion, but a solid three-dimensional machine, and the cardinal problem in electronic computing's pioneering years, taken on by both proposed electronic calculator and the first draft, was just this. How best to build a practical electronic form of the universal Turing machine? Andrew Hodges, a famous British mathematician and author, had conflicting statements about the Turing machine, saying, The essential point of the stored program computer is that it is built to implement a logical idea. The Universal Turing Machine of 1936 There is not a shred of direct evidence, nor was the design as described in his paper in any way influenced by practical considerations. The interest in building an actual machine may have been at the back of his mind all the time after 1936. Additionally, Max Newman, son of Turing's mentor, said, The description that Turing gave of a universal computing machine was entirely theoretical in purpose, but Turing's strong interest in all kinds of practical experiment made him even then interested in the possibility of actually constructing a machine on these lines. These favourable quotes have been cited many times in literature and taken out of context as evidence for the universal Turing machine being the idea behind the computer, but often the claims are vague and unsupported. This presentation follows these debates and explains some of the points laid out in Leo Corrie's paper, as well as others' research to add insight into the historical path that occurred from the universal Turing machine and the stored program computer. Why is this a topic of important research? The modern society is heavily dependent on computers, and whatever machine or device is used, whether it sends email, take a photograph, or analyse the human genome, they are all based on the same principles of reading an input, performing some task, and returning an output. But the meaning of the word computer has changed over history, with the idea of a computer being formulated from the early works of Charles Babbage's 1840s analytical engine, which was developed even before electricity, Arda Lovelace who published the first algorithm to be computed on this machine. Although many assume that Turing's work was a preface to the modern general purpose computer, it's important to fully understand the connection of the 1936 ideas of the universal Turing machine to modern machines, and to understand what the concept of a machine was to Turing in, at this time. Corey's ACM article, Turing's Pre-War Analog Computers, The Fatherhood of the Modern Computer Revisited, aims to shed light on the history of the development and construction of the general purpose stored com program computational devices developed in the 1940s. He says, it's very important for us to study and correctly understand our history so that we can better prepare for our future. But from a research point of view, this discussion is important to fully understand the ideas portrayed in Turing's 1936 paper, Computable Numbers. To make a valid argument, we must first understand the ideas behind the Turing machines formulated in the Computable Numbers paper. In 1936, Alonzo Church and his student Turing aimed to come up with a proof to the logic problem known as Einstein-Dung's problem, or the decision problem. 
This problem is that of proving whether a given cis statement or proposition is automatically provable in a logical system. Or, more simply, does an algorithm exist to determine the conclusion to this statement in all cases? Turing devised the Turing machine to show that no computable approach exists to solving the problem. To solve the problem, then you must be able to devise a method which decides whether the Turing machine halts or not given the problem, which Turing proved was not solvable through proof by contradiction. By developing a paradoxical method where a subroutine returns that it halts but then calls an infinite loop. So in this case, the truth is inconsistent and does the opposite to what it says. A black box or computer was envisioned that takes in inputs, performs instructions and outputs an answer. Black box is the core concept of where the Turing machine comes from. The Turing machine is a mathematical model of computation. It manipulates symbols on a strip of tape according to some rules and is capable of computing any computer algorithm. The root thinking behind these machines is that they operate on an infinite tape which represents memory or storage, which is divided into discrete cells. The machine positions its head over a cell and can either scan the symbol there on the cell the head is over, edit the symbol by writing a new symbol or erasing it, move the tape left or right to read and edit the neighbouring squares. The idea of the machine state is used to tell the machine what instructions to execute once the machine enters that state, and which state to move to after completing the instruction, allowing specifying the order of execution, simulating a finite state machine. The input to the Turing machine is the binary characters on the tape, where the output is then the contents of the tape when the machine halts, which gives the answer to the problem. The problem with individual Turing machines is that they have to be reconstructed for each new computation. Universal Turing machines solve this by taking into a description of the specific machine, M, as well as the input tape. The Universal Turing machine can then simulate machine M on the rest of the contents of the input tape. This turns out to be the essence of computation, which can simulate any computer algorithm. Because of this, it is said that Turing came up with a blueprint to build modern computers which can manipulate strings of ones and zeros to solve problems. The first thing to note is though, although Turing refers to computers in this text, there is nothing that may indicate that he was implying the use of actual physical devices as part of the analysis. Computers he referred to are humans who can calculate when Turing uses the term constructing a machine, he instead means constructing in the same terms as when Turing speaks about constructing a proof or constructing a number, which he asks, is it computable? Looking back at this paper, it is easy to immediately think of physical components. When Turing mentions inks or paper ribbons, he is actually thinking about abstract entities from a mathematical perspective. For example, if we regard a symbol as literally printed on a square, we may suppose that the square is naught to one in the x and y dimensions. In Turing's own words, the symbol is defined as a set of points in this square. V, the set is occupied by the printer's ink. If these sets are restricted to be measurable, we can define the distance between two symbols as the cost of transforming one symbol into the other. If the cost of moving unit area of printer's ink unit distance is unity, and there's infinite supply of ink at x equals 2 and y equals 0, with this topology, the symbols form a conditionally compact space. Turing wrote a follow-up two-page French summary of his paper, where he used suggestive wording, making it seem like he was thinking from an engineering standard point. He explicitly described the machine in terms of different arrangements of levers, wheels, etc. But again, this has been taken out of context, and it is clear Turing is speaking figuratively, which is obvious from his next statement, which involves tackling problems infinite sets, which would make no sense in a physical device. A real computing machine should be able to write as many digits as one wishes. A machine M is called malicious, or méchant, which in English is referred to as circular, if there is a number N such that M will never write N digits. He then went on to say, an application of Cantor's diagonal argument proves that there exists no machine that, if provided with the description of an arbitrary machine M, can decide if M is malicious. Turing's contemporaries, such as Gödel, Birch, and Kleene, were all working on creative solutions in this area, 
but Turing was the first to introduce such discourse in the word machine, which led to Church coining the term Turing machine, which further obscured the original view Turing devised. Church was also tackling the decision problem through his lambda calculus, and Turing was his student. So in re reviewing Turing's paper, he described the Turing machine as a computing machine, to mean a machine of finite size, which was different than the point Turing was making. Hodges at the time wrote that Turing did not refer to machines of finite size and did not define computability in terms of the alleged power of finite machines. This discourse led to discussions of Turing's work using the term machine in a loose manner. Turing never reacted to Church's characterization or similar remarks, however it is assumed that Turing did not see these accounts as unreasonable. In 1938, a colleague of Turing, Alistair Watson, gave an interesting description of Turing's machines. Turing's theory of computable numbers uh, is essentially that of mathematical expressions, but he has put it in a rather striking way in terms of machines which would calculate decimals in accordance with rules that correspond to different mathematical expressions for sequences of this kind. He shows how each such machine can be given a number different for each machine and so concludes that the machines, and therefore the numbers calculated by them, form an innumerable set. Although we can give every machine a number, it is impossible to give a mechanical method by which we can ascertain whether any particular machine is really circle-free. From 1936 to 1938, Church took a PhD, sorry, took a PhD under Church at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which further developed his research in machines. The idea of his research was an oracle, which by definition cannot be a machine, and involves an unspecified means of solving number theory problems. He named this idea O-Machines. In particular, Turing was focused on the number theory of the Riemann hypothesis. Around this time period, Turing was involved in designing two actual calculating devices, but like the computable numbers research, there was nothing in the research of this oracle to suggest the idea of building an actual device or suggest that the universal Turing machine would be an appropriate basis to building some kind of calculator. HVAC was the first stored program computer, and the computer scientist John von Neumann was the main contributor to this system. For this reason, Turing's encounter with von Neumann at Princeton is a highly documented instance that is referenced a lot in the works for people who argue for the direct connection between a universal Turing machine and the Universal Stored Program Computing Machine. John von Neumann shared Turing's dream of building a Universal Stored Program Computing Machine. Von Neumann had learned of the Universal Turing Machine before the war. He and Turing came to know each other during 1936 and 1938 when both were at Princeton University. Due to the prominence of both individuals in the development of the modern computer, it seems obvious to assume their conversation was around the idea of building calculating machines, but there is some evidence against this. Turing wrote a letter soon after his arrival stating that there's a great number of the most distinguished mathematicians. Unfortunately, there are not nearly so many logic people here as last year. Church, of course, but Gödel, Versa, Keane and Bernays have left. This implied he did not include von Neumann in the group studying logic, and it is commonly known that von Neumann abandoned his work in the area of logic, and they were likely instead talking about their work on continuous groups, as they were both working on this topic at the time. Turing even rejected von Neumann's offer later on to be his assistant. It is assumed von Neumann offered this position because of Turing's 1936 work, but there is no evidence in this. Instead, von Neumann's letter of recommendation for Turing early in the years implies von Neumann had not started to think about computing machines, indicating Turing had done good work in branches of mathematics in which I am interested, namely theory of almost periodic functions and theory of continuous groups. So there is no direct evidence showing that von Neumann was interested or even knew about the universal Turing machine before the war. This is very likely as Turing's work was not very popular at the time. Only two people requested off prints of his paper and in general, Turing had been disappointed with the reaction. At the time after his publication and before being recruited at Bletchley Park, the central site for code breakers in World War II, Turing had been involved in construction of two different calculators. The first was an electronic multiplier. 
This brought the possibility as using its basis for a computing device, and Hodges said it was an attempt by Turing to build a physical embodiment of a Turing machine meant to deal with mathematical problems with a network of relay operated switches, all machined by Turing himself, acting as the counterpart to the configurations in a Turing machine. There is no available evidence that Turing would have described his work like this, and Hodges later says his amateur engineering was closest Turing came to developing his ideas of general computation, implying that Turing didn't see his universal Turing machine as a blueprint for a physical counterpart, and a general purpose stored program computer was beyond what Turing had in mind. Turing's second calculator was designed in 1939, which was for calculating approximate values of the Riemann zeta function on its critical line, continuing his interest in the problem from back at Princeton, with his colleague Titchmarsh's innovation of establishing the first 1041 non-trivial uh, zeros of zeta that all satisfied the hypothesis. Turing had been aware of the recent work of Comrie, who used human computers, mainly women to do the calculations would work in a pipeline. Instead, Turing designed an analogue machine to perform the task, relying on a machine built for tide prediction in Liverpool, England, which performed trigonometrical summations based on a combination of pulley wheels that would represent the gravitational effects of a tide, affecting the tide. Turing wanted to use this idea to calculate the zeros of zeta for the Riemann hypothesis. This was never completed due to the outbreak of the war. Hodges described this project as a special machine, not coined by Turing. This is a misleading description of the project. Turing had approached the construction in this way because he was compelled to. It was not a limited version of a general purpose digital machine, or a limited version of a universal Turing machine. Turing had just decided that using analog computers was most suitable for the task. These computers were the natural choice of problems like this at the time, like the tide predicting machine at Liverpool which were not general purpose machines and represent numbers in terms of distances or voltages rather than binary values. In September 1939, Turing left Cambridge to go to Bletchley Park, where he devoted all his working time into code-breaking projects for the military, setting aside his research at the time. In these projects, Turing was exposed to various machines, building on his current knowledge, and Turing's later work on electronic computers were deeply influenced from the time spent at Bletchley. It is here that Turing developed the Enigma machine, which achieved the most recognition and fame internationally for its work in deciphering the German Enigma code in World War II. Turing continued with classical debates on mathematics with Newman in the 1940s, replying with this letter. I think you take a much more radically Hilbertian attitude about mathematics than I do. You say, if all this whole formal outfit is not about finding proofs which can be checked on a machine, it's difficult to know what it is about. Do you have in mind that there is, or should be, or could be, what has not been actually described anywhere, some fixed machine, and that the formal outfit is, as it were, about this machine? If you take this attitude, there's little more to be said. We simply have to get used to the technique of this machine and resign ourselves, resign ourselves to the fact that there are some problems to which we can never get the answer. If you think of various machines, I don't see your difficulty. One imagines different machines allowing different sets of proofs, and by choosing a suitable machine, one can approximate truth by provability better than with a less suitable machine, and can, in a sense, approximate it as well as you please. The choice of a machine involves intuition, or, as an alternative, one may go straight for the proof, and this again requires intuition. The key point to take from this quote is Turing mentions the possibility of having different types of machines for different kinds of mathematical problems. This adds to the fact that Turing was not thinking about general purpose machines when developing the idea of a universal Turing machine. Although the universal Turing machine was highly successful for dealing with the Enschai Dung's problem, it does not mean that it provided a model for a physical universal machine and did not inspire Turing's later machines. We have shown that Turing's oracle could not be a standard Turing machine, and from the comments to Newman, it is obvious that different situations call for a different choice of machine. When Turing returned to the task of calculating zeros of the Weimann hypothesis in 1950, the developments of the automatic computer meant his prior research on machines were obsolete and was now writing programs to run on the Manchester Mark I, a stored program electronic general purpose machine. 
Whilst Turing's advancements to the machines we now use daily cannot be dismissed, and the groundwork that was laid by the universal Turing machine has influenced computers and computer scientists alike, as a comparison, we cannot draw direct parallels between the two. However, we undoubtedly will continue to see scientists draw their own conclusions to this issue for the rest of our lives.